okay, so uh, we're going to have a quick transition here. Uh, Y'all know, if you know me, uh, that I can't get a group of people together and not actually share a little bit of data. So don't run. No, there, there, are two, oh yeah, there are two great panels coming up, so just bear with me for like five minutes where I share, share some data and then you'll hear from some uh, more inspiring people. So, what I want to do, I'm going to start with a caveat, as all good pres presentations do, start with caveats, right? Uh, there's a lot we know, but there's a whole lot that we don't know about the results last week. And so, you know, there's an importance to uh, getting it right rather than getting it first. There's a lot of data that drives me crazy. If you ever stumbled across my Twitter account, you can see that about 90% of it is ranting about exit polls. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so don't do it. Friends don't let friends spread exit polls. <laughs> Uh, there are things we know, right? Like, we, we eventually will have, this is the creepy part for the people who aren't aware of this, which most of you probably are, but we're going to have the vote history of every single person who voted, the 100 some odd million, almost 116 million people who voted. We'll know who voted, we'll know a lot about them, we'll be able to tell a pretty comprehensive story about what happened. The problem is, that takes a little while. So, we will be coming back over the coming months, and uh, in uh, the beginning of the, the new year and talking more about that. So for now, I just want to share a few sort of random interesting points that we found in the data with what we do know and focus on that. So just a couple things. I think folks probably paid a little bit of attention to the early vote, really striking. And we saw the early vote. Now, you know, there are obviously still votes being counted, but it's about 43 million people voted, cast their ballot before election day which is insane. That was almost at the level of 2016. The 2016 number was insane. That was a record. If you go back to 2014, the number is 22, almost double from the previous midterms. So, you know, there was the first sign, obviously, that we had that there was uh, something pretty remarkable happening. Uh, I promise not to read from this chart. Uh, I'm gonna read from this paper instead. No. Uh, uh, if you go to targetearly.targetsmart.com, it's a great uh, website that I'm super proud of our team at Target Smart for putting together really on the fly uh, in the last couple weeks of the election cycle. It includes some really interesting data comparing the early votes to previous election cycles. And one of the things that really jumped out, we're going to hear more about this in a little bit, was the youth vote. And when you look at this, you know, people will say, oh, well, the increase in youth vote, that's not a big deal because there's not that many of them. Well, we're talking about shares. We're talking about young people in the early vote. 2014 were 5.6% of the electorate. They went all the way up to 9.5%, people under the age of 30. That's significant, substantial, and impactful. Uh, when you look at where that happened, every state but two, don't know what happened in Arkansas, Louisiana, but every other state, Younger people increased their share of the electorate in the early vote. And again, when you're talking about 43 million votes nationally, it's a lot of people. That's not just uh, something that's academically interesting. It was impactful. Uh, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is a little bit different as a, just a BBM, a vote by mail state. But still, there were over 100,000 ballots cast in Pennsylvania. We started seeing this when we started looking in, in the aftermath of the Parkland tragedy. We asked the question, are younger people actually getting engaged, you know, for, for someone who went to the March for Our Lives in D.C. and saw the, the, the younger people were so brave talking about the importance of getting out and, and, and voting and registering vote, would that have an impact? There were a lot of skeptics. And we saw it with voter registration first, where we saw younger people occupying a larger share of new registrants in that period after that tragedy. Uh, than before. And then we saw it when we looked at the primary elections and we saw younger people turning out at high rates and there was still skepticism. And then we saw it in the early vote. And again, we don't have the actual vote history, but I'm fairly confident that we'll see that in the final vote as well. Pennsylvania was the state that led the way after Parkland in terms of the increase in the youth registration. And this is amazing that, that in, in 14 people under the age of 30 were 8% of early vote electorate. They went all the way up to almost 19%. Uh, in in 2018. Uh, two more parts to look at here in terms of the early vote. Uh, it wasn't just people are skeptical about the early vote. They said, well, it's just, you know, if people would have voted anyhow, it's coming out early, it doesn't really matter. They said it's cannibalizing the election day vote. That wasn't what happened. You don't have 43 million people vote early 
uh, by cannibalizing your election day vote. And you look at the number, 2.1 people voted before election day who had never voted in any election before. Not in the primary, not in the presidential, nothing. They cast their first ballot. That was 5% of all ballots cast. 8.3 million people we considered freedom voters. These are people who vote just in presidential years only. They generally wouldn't vote in the midterm at all. They were one out of five early votes. When you combine that with the people who never voted, one quarter of them were people who otherwise wouldn't have voted in a normal uh, midterm election, which this was very much not. When you look at race and ethnicity, this was a more diverse electorate than we've seen in the midterm in a very, very long time. Uh, big surges, especially with Latino voters, with Asian voters, the white share of the electorate dropped by almost three points. So what does that all add up to? Uh, big surges in turnout. This was the highest turnout midterm election we've seen in 104 years. 1914 was the last time we had midterm turnout this high in terms of share of eligible population. First midterm election ever that saw more than 100 million people vote. And like I said, the, the final number is likely to be somewhere around 116 million. So not only did it pass that threshold, it blew past it. Uh, last two points I want to make, and then we're going to get to our next panel. Uh, so bear with me. But we talk about, there's all this talk after 2016, we talked about this in New Jersey CD2, about the Obama-Trump voters, right? There was, everyone was fascinated with the Obama-Trump voters. People went down and went Republican. What happened to them? So, you know, uh, there, there, there are some issues with how you can figure out who those people are. So we wanted to look at Obama-Trump districts. The districts that swung the most from 12 to 16 against Democrats. What happened with those districts? So we take the 30 districts, that had the biggest swing. And those districts, there was about a 10 point drop off for Democrats from 12 to 16. And there was again, the sort of national narrative that maybe this 2018 midterm was just about Republicans going, you know, red areas becoming more red, blue areas becoming more blue. That wasn't what happened. What we saw is those districts began coming back. So of those 30 districts, 23 of them are rural, not surprising, right? Overwhelmingly rural. Uh, in those districts, the Dem drop off in 16 was 10 points. We got 6.1% of that back. There was a bounce back in those districts. Not as much as we saw in the few suburban districts, the six districts where that increase was 7.6%, but it's still significant. So it's, again, the narrative is not always as simple uh, as we want to make it out to be. Last point, the flip side of this. There was a lot of focus on what we call the Clinton GOP districts, the districts that Secretary Clinton won, uh, and then Republican members of Congress were still elected in 2016. There are 25 of those districts, and everyone assumed those to be party districts for a good reason. There's a big question with Donald Trump, uh, Congressman Alex Andrew talked about how he sucks all the air out of the room, it's true, he sucked all the air out of the Republican Party too, because they, uh, Democrats flipped 20 of those seats, maybe 21, depending on California. Uh, you see what happened. You look at those districts. You look at the fact that Republicans went O for Orange County. They went O for New England. Uh, uh, the, the, in, in fact, Democrats have picked up, I love this stat, Democrats have picked up more seats in Orange County over the last 48 hours than they picked up between 2002 and 2012. <laughs> And here you see what happened to these seats, right? It was mixed, mostly suburban districts, some urban districts, some rural districts, but they were bouncing back. Uh, so again, some basic numbers that I wanted to share. So with that, we're actually gonna go right into our next panel. And I will get to make sure I'm talking about